African-American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and education. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they had been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I am your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr. Joining us on today's program is Dr. Alpha Alexander, Director of Health Promotion and Sports of the YWCA of the United States of America, and also a member of the United States Olympic Committee. And Alpha, speaking of legends, who were and are some of the great black women athletes, the legends, as it were? The uh, African-American uh, female in this society, uh, since I was a little girl, really was highlighted, Wilma Rudolph and Athea Gibson. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, though, are not aware of Inez Patterson, who actually participated in three sports, tennis, track and field, and basketball. And little as the boom is today of women's basketball, not many people talk about Lucy Harris. The Ashley was on a three-time national championship team with a little school in Mississippi called Delta State. And she was originally one of the most prolific women's basketball players in this country. Uh, going back to the Olympics, I understand that Alice Coachman from Tuskegee University uh, won a gold medal in the high jump in the 1948 Olympics. That is correct. And she was the first African-American woman to win an Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. And since then, we all know about Jackie joyner Kersey and Flo Jo and Gwen Torrance and just a whole large number mm -hmm. of African-American women who participate in the Olympics and, as you said, in um, gymnastics mm -hmm. and in basketball and practically every sport uh, for example, Althea Gibson, who was a champion both in tennis mm -hmm. and golf. But over the past, let's say, 15 years, since 1980 or thereabouts, the opportunities for women of all backgrounds uh, in sports has improved tremendously. And what is that attributed to? Because women's sports are really hot now. That's uh, correct. Uh, some would say that it's contributed to Title IX. What uh, is Title IX? Title IX is a federal law that was legislative in 1972 from Congress to give equitable distribution of dollars on collegiate and high school level and elementary school level of girls participating in sport, as well as accessibility to facilities, as well as equal in terms of travel time, lodging, food, and et cetera. Uh, so some would contribute uh, to the law of Title IX, but a lot of advocates today are looking back and saying, 1972, it's almost 25 years ago. Really, how much have we really accomplished? Well, let us stop for a moment. Let's look at Title IX. Mm -hmm. See, Title IX is really part of the Civil Rights Act. That is correct. And Title IX really relates not only to women in sports, but to opportunities for women in education. Mm -hmm. And many of the schools increase the number of scholarships and outreach for women, mm -hmm. as well as for African Americans. Mm -hmm. And some people say that the Civil Rights Act is the real testimony to Martin Luther King and what he was able to do with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So taking this Title IX, first of all, it took about 10 years to interpret it. Um, <laughs> many funny. of the administrators, both in sports and other educational programs, uh, looked at it as sort of a token thing. We have to get some women involved because we have to meet this requirement. But I believe the women's advocates, particularly people like Donna Lopiano and others in the sports world, began to bring their case before the courts. I don't remember which college it was. It was a challenge to a college where they were not spending the same amount of money or the same proportion of money on women's athletes. Mm -hmm. And the argument, of course, was that women are not that interested in sport. Mm -hmm. Well, pick it up from there. What happened then? Well, uh, there's a couple of classic cases, and um, advocates such as myself and Donna Lopiano and other people in the arena, uh, a lot of uh, cases have been uh, taken to court, but after 10 or 15 years, you know, being in the court system and actually not direct outcome coming out of that, uh, we feel as though that uh, the Civil Rights uh, Office needs to step up in terms of the level of enforcement. And as of today, uh, that's sort of uh, the women af advocates of what we're trying to advocate to look and say, look, Title IX is 25 years old. Exactly how many cases have been actually decided? There's been some landmark cases. Temple University is one of those cases. And 
uh, there was a complaint against a class action suit of a group of athletes of accessibility based on food and et cetera uh, to the athlete, the women athletes. But uh, what has happened is I think also there's the segment of society that says that Title IX really has helped uh, or hindered the development of men's quote-unquote minor sports. And so uh, men uh, wrestlers and uh, the canoe people are really up in arms in terms of saying the monies that you're dumping into the women's program really has effectuated in terms of the development of men's fencing and men's wrestling, et cetera. Well, of course, that really is a question of the fixed box. Mm -hmm. Is there a fixed box of expenditures on athletics? And as we know, with the big-time schools, the Division I schools, uh, give 95 football scholarships and 15 basketball scholarships and so many hockey scholarships, et cetera, mm -hmm. because those are popular sports among the men and among the general public. Mm -hmm. But what's happening now, I think, with the success of uh, women in basketball in particular, mm -hmm. um, more of the fans are watching. They even have professional leagues now. So that's going to put more pressure on the colleges to provide more support, at least for basketball, but what you call minor sports, and I don't like to use the word minor because a sport is a right, sport. Right. What you really mean is sports that do not have a lot of audience appeal mm -hmm. and are not as popular uh, as some of the sports such as basketball, football, baseball. But, but track is considered to be a major I mean, until the Olympics. You don't have a lot of people come to see that. So part of this minor uh, appellation is a function of people's attitudes. Mm -hmm. But the other argument is that a relatively small number of athletes participate in those sports and it costs money to send them to travel, to buy uniforms, etc. Uh, how do you rationalize that, particularly when some of that money that's being spent on athletics might be better spent for tutoring programs to help minority and other students graduate from college? Well, uh, it would be uh uh, very interesting to say that a lot of people uh, would advocate less to remove football, period, out of the picture in terms of intercollegiate athletics in this country. And um, ma make them a professional league and pay them a salary? Totally exempt them yeah. uh, out of, in terms of the academic, you know, institutional collegiate level. And then on the other side, uh, some people are looking at, uh, particularly Title IX and the impact, there's a lot in terms of the Black Coaches Association analyzing the impact of that that really is hurting uh, the African-American athlete in this impact country. Impact of what is hurting them? Uh, Title IX and uh, cutbacks being um, uh, developed across the intercollegiate level. A lot of track programs are being dropped on the intercollegiate level. There's scholarship uh, programs. For example, Temple University now only has two scholarships that they're going to be offering to their men uh, track and field. So a lot of uh, coaches are looking at Title IX really affecting them based on race, also in the number of participants having accessibility in certain types of sport. I advocate that uh, based on gender and the population on the co campus, I think that's a good formula base to look at. Uh, but what, I also... Uh, what formula would you propose? The number of uh, gender base that you have on the campus, the number of females, the number of male students, and really calculate in terms of dollars being proportionate on the campus uh, available to the collegiate athletes. And, in other you know, words, if 53% uh, if of the student body was women, 53% of the money for sports should go to women? That's correct. That's my well, advocation. Of course, in some sense, that's not uh, overly realistic, cause even though there are a number of very uh, involved women athletes, mm -hmm. the percentage who are involved in athletics and almost any kind of us are not as large as those of, among the men. So uh, other than the fact you'd get a backlash, you'd have a kind of a logical problem working that through. Well, I, I, I would uh, speculate if not the money's totally spent in the intercollegiate athletic area because there's other sports, for example, women's soccer is really growing and making it available to the female students on that campus. Let's put the dollars in terms of the recreation and intramural mm -hmm. program still based on gender. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I don't see in a lot of campuses, uh, particularly gender-based uh, recreational opportunities or sports that traditionally, um, you know, it's not as popular, such as fencing or such as ping pong or such as uh, canoeing or let's take golf or, you know, some other sports that could be accessible to that student, student body. Well, the result of this emphasis as limited as though you suggested may be, I think it's a little <laughs> bit more broad spread that you're suggesting. There have been a number 
of women athletes developed uh, in basketball, swimming, track, soccer, a whole gymnastics, a whole range of activities. Mm -hmm. And as more people participate at the college and visible level, more begin to participate at the high school and the junior high school and elementary level, mm -hmm. which I think has had a major impact on participation of girls and women in sports. For example, Little League now has girls playing with the boys. Yes, that's and right. Young men playing with the young women mm -hmm. uh, in some of the leagues. So many parents now and social organizations, community-based, how do I develop the athlete potential of the women in my community? Yeah. And I know the Olympic Committee and the YWCA have a lot of programs that are aimed at doing that. Mm -hmm. So could you describe some of those programs and how they work? Okay. Well, the YWCA, uh, being a, the only female, uh, primary female organization that's a member of the United States Olympic Committee, our task is uh, basically to uh, uh, direct uh, activities or development grassroots programs, especially for girls. Uh, we've been very successful right here in New York. Uh, Wendy Hillard's program, the Rhythmic Gymnastic Program, every Saturday uh, working with kids uptown and developing them into promising rhythmic gymnasts. Uh, the program, the activities, some of the kids are drawn from the YWCA, but they learn the basic skill uh, development, talking, uh, targeting from 8 to 18. Another successful program is the Peter Westbrook program. Uh, we've been successful securing money from the Olympic Committee and the YWCA uh, basically outreaching to Peter Westbrook and particularly targeting kids up in uptown uh, to learn but fencing. When you say uptown, yeah. you probably mean the I'm talking uh, about upper Harlem. Manhattan, the Harlem, Right, because I'm a Manhattan resident. And yes. uh, Peter Westbrook is an African-American who was the Olympic fencing champion. That is correct, a five-time. And time. Wendy Hilliard is an African-American who was the Olympic gymnastic champion. That's correct. And I think well, you speak about this so easily because you deal with it every day, but I <laughs> think many of the public are not aware of the fact that there have been African-American Olympic champions in those sports. I think mm -hmm. Dominique Dawes, his uh, success in the 1996 Olympics, mm -hmm. brought some of that to light. But the fact is, as you suggest, there are African-American successful athletes in a number of the sports other than the so-called major sports of basketball, football, and baseball. Mm -hmm. um, now, do children or young people who are getting these programs uh, start out with a talent? Do they start with a lot of money so somebody can make them a champion? How does it work? How does a kid get into these programs? Well, another type of model, uh, other than working with uh, African-American role models that have been championed in their sport and giving back, uh, we have, uh, for example, during the Women's Final Four in Cincinnati, the Final Ohio. Final Four. Again, remember yeah. when you speak before <laughs> a general audience, right. not everybody is... Uh, Cognoscenti with all of the jargon of okay. sports. The, well, the women's final four. The women's final four, the NCAA, the National Collegiate Athletic Association, final championship during March Madness uh, is the women's final four teams that qualified to be the champion of the NCAA Division One institution. In other words, those four teams after a tournament right. compete N to see who's going to be the champion. Right, that okay. is correct. And as we know, um, Tennessee. Uh, has been the reigning champion for the past two years. That's the University of Tennessee. University of Tennessee, mm -hmm. the Lady Vols. Uh, but uh, we started uh, actually in that city in Cincinnati uh, with a clinic uh, that we open up for any female uh, youngster. We particularly are looking at 9 to 14-year-olds. And they came in and had a clinic by some of the Olympic athletes that were in the area uh, during that uh, activity of that week at the Final Four in Cincinnati, Ohio. And then that Saturday, we kicked off a 15-team league. And so the skill level uh, can traditionally uh, be none existing at all. And then we have some teams on a, on a higher scale level that really have developed over uh, the course of the time once the age range goes up are quite skillful. Uh, back in Santa Monica, California, uh, fathers came to the YWCA and asked, could you start an all-girls team? They were tired of their daughters sitting on the Boys and Girls Club bench. And so consequently, the first year, the fathers were the coach. Second year, the uh, mothers became the assistant coach. The third year, the mothers became the head coach. One year, the kids really, the girls loved all female uh, officials, which the national office, we uh, gave money to the Santa Monica YWCA to do. And I'm very pleased. We're in the 10th year, and we're ser servicing over 3,000 girls out in Santa Monica. So there's different types of model. That model particularly emphasizes not on the competitive, you know, win at all costs. It basically is 
based on uh, skill level development and not so much emphasis on in terms of a win-loss record. So we have different uh, types of programs. Well, part of the lack of participation in women in sports earlier had to do with certain cultural attitudes toward the participation of women. Indeed, in women's basketball, they had rules where women couldn't run the whole court and they had to be very careful in touching each other and the fouls, etc. But if we look at the most recent uh, tournaments, uh, the women run the whole court, go behind their back, push each other around, throw each other down. Is that something you really want women to be doing? Uh, I think uh, in these days and times, uh, that's what women will be doing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with aggression. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with experiencing in sport uh, win or loss. Uh, why is aggression good? Why is physical aggression good? Well, why does IBM or um, uh, General Electric or mm -hmm. some of the big companies are looking for women that are a little bit more on the aggressive side, but I still know physical uh, aggressive. Well, I phys say that, physical <laughs> aggression. Um, well, if you foul me, I'm going to foul you. But seriously, you know? <laughs> I, uh, we noticed that the game of basketball for both men and women has changed, and in some instances, it's difficult to tell between the basketball game and some of the football games the way people get thrown around, mm -hmm. uh, and that had to do with just some general attitudes about physical aggression. Mm -hmm. And clearly, as you state, uh, women have the same right to be physically aggressive as men have the same right to be physically aggressive. Mm -hmm. But how, uh, you work with a lot of mothers and heads of women's organization, uh, how do women in general feel about the increased activity in competitive sports, particularly those that end up to be physically aggressive? Um, I think uh, this is, uh, you know, in the late uh, 1990s, uh, that women, particularly head women uh, of nonprofit organizations, very strong female role models, uh, either did not have the experience of sport and realize this now the benefits uh, because with the young uh, youth that we're working with today, their self-esteem, their self-sense of their body, their self-empowerment really gives them a chance to make choices in life, uh, whether or not to say no, whether or not you know, not to end up in terms of the boxes, we would say, uh, Dr. Roscoe Brown in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. uh, it really gives a young lady a sense of self and a good self-esteem, a high self-esteem level. Uh, yes, uh, you had stated earlier culturally, uh, a long time ago I did a what they call the uh, dissertation, uh, and uh, I actually my dissertation was based on that, some of the culture differences. Mm -hmm. And I think as an African-American community, we've come a long way. Um, one of the, uh, the things that I think we try to mainstream, as my father wanted me to be a medical doctor, mm -hmm. but I wanted just to be a plain old gym teacher. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, there weren't a lot of role models. And mm -hmm. I was telling your control uh, people earlier that you were a role model for me mm -hmm. when I was young. Uh, because there were very few black physical educators out there. What was that? Is it just being a gym teacher or is it being someone like Dr. Roscoe Brown? And to be able to look up to that. Uh, so I see now some of the major uh, 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 players, uh, leaders in, in this country, women, they see the benefit of it or they've had the touch of the bite of being able to participate in sports since 1972 or they have become a sport advocate themselves, whether or not they run or whether or not they walk or whether or not they just go out and do Central Park, you know, once a week. So I, I think in terms of lack of fitness with the Center for Disease Control and some of these issues coming out and girl power uh, that now exist in the country, a lot more women are recognizing the importance of that. Uh, some of it, it took uh, longer than others, but I see nothing but positive stuff. Well, that. another hat you wear is as president of the Arthur Ashe Athletic Association, mm -hmm. uh, which was created by the late Arthur Ashe to help bring sports and education and social responsibility together. And he was particularly concerned about the exploitation of black athletes and the overemphasis on sports. But since we've been spending the past few minutes talking about how wonderful and how many women are involved in sports, particularly competitive sports, uh, how does that relate to what you do in Arthur Ashe Athletics? What are you trying to accomplish there? Uh, well, there's uh, four aspects of that organization. We're looking in terms of becoming a public policy advocate. Uh, we're looking in terms of career development, in terms particularly of African Americans. Uh, as, as athletes or as, as administrators or everything? Or as as I said earlier, as, as you, Dr. Roscoe mm. Brown, you're one of the most distinguished mm black physical educators I know in the United States that exist today. 
Uh, so really letting, um, and particularly targeting New York City, you know Arthur was very much concerned about this area, looking at physical education teachers or coaches and really helping develop them uh, and segue into their next career. I know last uh, week we had a, our mentoring symposium that we have each year, and every year the coaches just ran and rave about the session that you do for them uh, because they're not that familiar in terms of the rules and regulations, and also some of the other opportunities that are available to them. Well, what about the exploitation of athletes? There's so many kids now who said, I'm going to go to school, I'm going to play high school, but I'm going to get a scholarship, and then I'm going to become a pro, which is very unrealistic in that the odds of that coming to pro are about 1 in 10,000. Uh, what then do you do with this great amount of energy and emphasis on athletics? Uh, is it to the uh, detriment of the academic work, or do the bring it together, how, how does that work? Well, um, and I think uh, you would agree that Arthur would agree with us, it's really taking the energy in terms of the academic side. Uh, as you know, my mother and probably your mother said, you never can take education away from you. Mm -hmm. And so I think though it is important to have a well-balanced life. And so the experience in physical activity or in sports is a good experience. We know that's the only place you can lose without any very su significant consequences. Except and, losing your job. If you're right, coach. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I feel as though having a balanced life in terms of the academic as well as, mm -hmm. as, well as the physical. And if you don't have your physical body, mm -hmm. How could you have a sane mind? It's that whole mind, body, spirit of philosophy. Now, as far as uh, Arthur's legacy, you know, obviously one of the great tennis players of all time, first African-American to win at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open, uh, he dedicated himself to a number of things, uh, to the prevention of AIDS and the treatment of AIDS, which unfortunately he died of, uh, to helping young people to see that there's something beyond sport in terms of their life and their contribution to youth. How do you and the other members of the Arthur Ashe Athletic Association attempt to carry this out? Well, I think in terms of the distinguished trustees, uh, you're definitely one mm -hmm. of the trustees. Uh, the organization that we're involved with is one of the organizations he left behind that's multifaceted. And that's the difference besides being targeted on AIDS or just health mm -hmm. issues. But I think in being exemplary in times of the different programs, the mentoring symposium probably right now, consistently we've been in existence for four years, has been a highlight, uh, something that Arthur wanted to work with the PSAL students. We have 35,000 uh, people. PSA, L students. That's public school athletic as, uh, at, students. Right, in, the, in the, uh, New York City. Uh, but I think also in terms of being advocate in public policy issues, uh, whether it's Proposition 48 mm -hmm. or we don't want to go down that road today, but mm -hmm. uh, being spokespersons and writing papers in that area, uh, as well as holding uh, in collaboration uh, health-oriented uh, based on sudden uh, cardiac arrest among our black male athletes, uh, particularly in the basketball arena. Do you think, uh, do you think, also think there should have been specific academic requirements using the SAT in order for a student athlete to get a scholarship to a college? I'm going to ask you, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I think definitely yes. That's my opinion. You think they should be? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you, th what uh, impact will this have on those who can't make it? Uh, well, what, what do you do with those? Whenever you have a standard, it's always a question of those who make, make it, it fine. A, what happens to those who don't make it? Right. But uh, my question is later in life, what mm -hmm. happens to those that make it and what happens to those that don't? And, and, and in terms of really stepping up to the plate of that, the academic side, this is society, this is reality. Right before Arthur died, he went with me up in the projects and talked to a young man that uh, uh, was raised by his mom. And his mom and I talked, and I thought it was important for Arthur to talk to him. He had a choice to go between Harvard and Lafayette. And he was very articulate, very knowledgeable, and an outstanding basketball player in this area. Now, if you look back four years later, where is he now? He's not at Harvard. He went to Lafayette. He's now at Syracuse. And so consequently, Syracuse, he's doing quite well. But as Arthur said, if you can read and write, you're halfway over that bend. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the major crisis challenge facing black women in athletics is today? I think uh, in terms of one of the major crises is making it on the media side and in terms of career side in terms of the transition of the development. A lot of black female athletes are starting their foundation. I'm working with Don Staley and developing her foundation right now. 
Uh, but I think there's very few Robin Roberts uh, that's able to sit their name down on a $1 million contract. I think also, uh, segueing in terms of the arena, we had the development of the WNBA. And yes, we're going to have um, African-American female athletes on the court. But how many are actually going to own the teams? How many actually are going to have career paths surrounding this whole development of this new institution that's going to exist in this country? In other words, you're saying that the major challenge is how black women athletes can get rich? Not rich, but uh, being able to, what I call, after their athletic career is over with, segueing okay. to the other side. Because, Two years Irvin has been able to do it. Yeah, but <laughs> I think uh, it might be misleading to just focus on the media. There are right. many athletes who go into uh, education. They mm-hmm. become teachers, administrators, heads of social agencies, heads of smaller businesses. Because mm-hmm. one of the concerns about the overemphasis on sport is it does give somewhat unrealistic uh, views to uh, kids who participate. Right. And I know that you and Arthur and many of others are concerned about the whole range of activity. We like to focus on the Robin Robins of the world Mm -hmm. as an example of what could happen. But more probably, other than having good health as a result of their participating in sport, the main thing is that they will have an entree to a good uh, service-oriented uh, professional or business job. Right. And that's the kind of thing I know you and the author have been talking about uh, right. Dr. before Brown, he passed away. I have to uh, say, though, uh, for any young lady that's looking at the professional league, uh, it's not a question of getting rich because the maximum mm-hmm. amount in the salary is only going to be 50000 mm-hmm. That's peanuts these days. P- 50,000 is peanuts. We'll tell that to a lot of people. Know. <laughs> but today we've been talking with Dr. Alpha Alexander of the YWCA and the Olympic Committee. We we're talking about how things have changed in relation to women's sports, but particularly in relation to black women in sport. And I'm glad that we've been able to spend this time with you, Alpha, and to learn more about black women in sports. It's Thank been a you pleasure. very much. Thank you.